On behalf of Perfin, I would like to thank the presence of uh, all of you on the first Perfin Day. To open our schedule, I would like to invite Claudio Adagi, our host, who will talk about challenges of education in Brazil and the scholarship fund that the Perfin supports since 2012. So I hand it over to Claudio Adagi. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you here today. I will talk about education. I'll present an overview of the situation, how we stand today, and which are the challenges, how we are uh, performing so that we can have a frank and open dialogue about the matter. Well, the first question we ask ourselves is why education? It seemed quite obvious, but this, edu this question was asked many, many times in the past. Is education a good investment for society and for individuals? If education is really effective in terms of economic growth, and then we are going to see the current, uh, I'll present a current overview, what affects the schooling performance and how to improve this, what is the scenario of higher education, and talk about which are the causes of the educational delay we have in Brazil. If education is so good, why the society is not involved to improve it? So the first question is, is education a good investment? There are several studies about this matter, both in Brazil and abroad, and the conclusion is that education is a good investment. According to some studies, 33% of the increase of product by a worker would be explained by training and education. A study is developed in our school by Professor Nayasi Menezes showed that differences on the level of schooling explain 40% of wage differences and 26% of um, total income differences. There was a huge discussion in the past if this was a correlation uh, or it was a cause or a consequence. Is this a coincidence, a cause or a consequence? People are educated because they are born good or because they have a rich parents so they have access to good education and they become rich or because education really added something to their life, allowing them to be more competent professional with a better performance in the labor market. This question was asked positively in a towards uh, to education. Education is a cause and not a consequence. But here in Brazil, this question persisted for a long time. During the 70s, when I came back from Chicago after doing my doctorate, Langoni, Professor Langoni, at that time, wrote and published the thesis he had prepared in the University of Chicago showing that education, human capital, would be responsible for a large part of inequality of income in Brazil at that time, during the 90s. Uh, this was heatly discussed, including by the left wing. Left wing parties uh, usually are pro-education, but at that time in Brazil, as the left wing party was focusing on uh, wages and salary, they said education has nothing to do with what causes income inequality in Brazil or part wage um, policies. And this The impact of this was to to make us be really, really late in terms of education. We have a delay. So lots of uh, policies were implemented many, many years after this uh, period. As I have mentioned, I present in this short 
wage differences associated with education. On the horizontal axis, so we have the number of is education and training and salaries on the vertical axis. So things do not change over the last three years. So we have 17 years or more, an average uh, salary of 5,000 reais as against from zero to 10 uh, salaries around 600, 500 reais. The second question is, education is a good investment. Lots of studies uh, were done, especially one by Pessoa in Holanda that shows the rate of return is around 15% a year. When we imagine 15% a, a year, this is a real uh, return rate. So we have a very low volatility. So we believe it's a very good investment. For the first four years of schooling, this rate is going down because education in Brazil is spreading. We have a larger problem. I'll try to show you in a while. So a high school, so 25% of kids on schooling at schooling age, they attend school. So the number of, uh, in terms of number, we improved education in Brazil. Our problem today is quality of education and the bottleneck of high school. So anyway, this uh, caused the offer for people with low education level to increase a lot. The difference in terms of salaries and rate of return in this bracket is smaller. But we have a very high rate in preschooling, and this confirms lots of studies done in the world, education in preschooling. Here at INSPIR, we are conducting a study together with Harvard and the University of Sao Paulo about the first years. And this study confirms that returns to study, which is not study properly, but activities that may help the development of cognitive and non-cognitive uh, abilities on the f early ages. They have a very important impact both on learning and how this person will behave professionally in the real world, in the labor market. This study started by an economist, a Nobel Prize, Hackman. He's conducted many studies. They proved this. So early ages is really, really important for a human being. This is another evidence that wages increase according to the number of schooling years. So wages are higher. People retire, they leave the labor market, and the curve is normal. The red curve that corresponds to 12 years of schooling is superior to the other ones. These are data from Pinage. But the variance of higher education and courses you see the difference of wages for a person who studies medicine, engineering, uh, economy is different from someone who study letters, administration, the variance between the administration courses are very, very good. This is the most sought after course in Brazil after law, but law uh, administration is almost uh, above uh, law today. There was a recent study from NIASU showing that schooling, school performance all impact salaries. To be a good student is something that impacts uh, the future wage increases. If you are a good student, you will learn more and will have a wage difference in the future. Well, what is the current overview, uh, the, cur the scenario of Brazilian education? Proficiency of studies in Brazil is really bad. This is the percentage of students 
on levels below the adequate level. It was measured by SAEB, by Brazil test, and also by INIM. When they get fifth grade on average on Brazil, 63.7% of the students do not have an, a learning level that, it, that may be considered ad adequate. At ninth e year, 83.1% do not have an adequate level of learning. And on the third year of high school, 90% of students do not have a learning level that may be considered adequate. This is a tragedy. Only 10% of all students that conclude high school have a level that may be considered adequate. Private school presents better results than public schools, but uh, we have very good public uh, schools that have a, a very good performance but on average, private schools are better than the public schools. Here we have the same thing. We can see that performance is developed and growing, but on the first years, up to fifth grade, when after fifth grade, fifth grade honor, onwards from the eighth to ninth school, which is the pre-high school, the performance is very, very slow. And on high school, it's really stagnant and with a trend, with a downwards trend. So high school is really the bottleneck. Pre-high school and high school, these are the Brazilian bottlenecks. And the, this is a tragic situation, as we are talking about 10%, but these are the number of students that go to high school. So we are saying here that only 5% of all students have an adequate level of education. And this is basically what we've seen before. The level is improving, the blue curve. It is improving in the fourth grade with a slight improvement on eighth grade, but stable. And on high school, it's stable with a downward trend if we analyze this graph properly. And when we talk and compare Brazil in, with the international scenario, this, the scenario is very bad. P the former education minister, Paulo Renato, he introduced many good policies, national tests, and he tried to include Brazil at PISA. It was a very brave uh, act because he, he was aware that Brazil would have a very poor performance. Politicians usually want to have a very good uh, image, but he wanted to include Brazil at PISA to have a transparency. And Brazil is there on the Point. This is the last piece of 2012, and uh, Brazil grade is getting worse and worse. Well, actually, it improved slightly. We are 391 as against 386, and we ranked uh, 58th. Uh, place among 65 countries. So we have a stable positioning in relation to the results of 2009. When we look at the elite, we say, well, Brazil is a big country. It's concentrated. We need to compare our elite with the elite of other countries. So these are the 5% superior uh, br from Brazil in comparison with the same bracket of other countries. So the scenario is almost the same. So uh, education in Brazil in relation to other countries is uh, uh, far from idea. The, the overview is not a absolute. It's absolute and relative in, at all levels. Well, there is a hypothesis that is really approved by the media. They say poor performance is because uh, teachers are badly paid in the public uh, schools. The problem is 
private school have a better performance than public school. And when we do a study about overall performance of the public school and private school, number of hours works, retirement benefits, fringe benefits, all the expected remuneration for a public school teacher in comparison with a private uh, school teacher. We see that public school teachers earn more than a private school teacher. We did the calculation. They have stability in work. You have retirement plans, pension plans, 25 years for uh, students, uh, women uh, teachers, and uh, 30 for male teachers. So you join the school when you were 20, you retire at 50, and you still live extra 30 years with a full salary. So if we discount, discount all this flow, taking into account stability, a number of hours work, so public school teachers earn more than private school teachers. But performance of uh, students on private schools are better than public schools. So this hypothesis has no um, relation to facts. Both ha have poor salaries. This is not the case, but the performance to be explained by a teacher's wage is not supported uh, with uh, evidence and reality. Here, we conducted several studies uh, about what impacts um, schooling performance. So we have variables from school and family. The schooling is responsible for 20 to 30 percent of schooling performance. Even if public policy improves the school, this is a very morose process because if you are not improving the family variables, school performance will develop very, very slowly. So computers at school, does it impact uh, school performance? The conclusion is no, they do not impact C professor education and training. It does not have any impact except on high school level. Professor, teachers training do not impact performance. At least trainings we have today. Maybe they attend just to get the certificate that will allow him to grow faster in his career, but in terms of performance and result, there's no impact. Expenditures from cities, no. Teachers salaries, no. Size of the class, number of students on the class. On a private uh, schools, the salaries impact on private schools. The schools, the better schools uh, will pay more, and this will have an impact on performance. At size of the class, library, do not impact, because many schools we visit, libraries are closed because teachers fear students destroy and steal their books. They just, so the fact to ha of having a library won't change, but the numbers of hours impact. On average, in Brazil, less than half of uh, school classes are really ministered. And unity of federation. Some states have a better education than others. Minas Gerais, for instance, is a, 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 an outstanding state. Education in Minas is really top in Brazil. And states in the northeast and north regions are below average spend more resolves. No, we need to invest more in education. Here on the vertical axis, we have average proficiency on mathematics in the, in the city of Sao Paulo, and the horizontal axis, we see expenditures per student. So it goes from 4,000 to 16,000 per student, and math, math performance does not vary a lot. 
if you want to find a positive relation, it's a very weak one between expenditures and performance. Now, we have many examples, successful examples in Brazil. One of them is Sobral. That's a municipality in the state of Ceará whose performance of children in school s has evolved significantly in the last couple of years. The considerable effort with continuity led to significant results. That is, it's possible to change. Here we have a graph from Sobral. You see that they started from a basis in the red curve, a very low basis. That's about mathematics. That was below Sao Paulo, which is the black line. And the performance is higher than the average performance of Sao Paulo. Of course, Sobral has a little number of students. And Sao Paulo has 11 million inhabitants. But anyway, it shows that there was an effort in Sobral, which was very successful. And also in Sao Paulo, nothing was done to improve significantly high school in the city. By the way, Sao Paulo, in average, 28 days of absence of teachers in 2012. 28 days of absence, apart from vacations, useful days, weekdays. If we look at this data of hours, classroom hours, that if were actually ministered is half. So you have the absence and classes that start late, that are interrupted, that end earlier, uh, holidays, events, a lack of flights, a series, a series of things uh, that will really decrease the number of classrooms that are really ministered. That's a tragedy because we know that given classes will affect the performance. If the student in this is at school and is not learning, it, there is no magic. This is a great problem. What Sobral has done, they focused on smaller children in literacy. It was a policy that had a continuity. The municipality adopted that as a municipal policy. Even if the mayors changed, this had continuity. This is extremely important in education. You cannot make an experiment, a test, and then go back and change. You need continuity. And there was accountability, which is also very important. Who is responsible for education? There was an accountability of schools, of principals, so that the performance of the students improved. Professors that had stability, they cannot be fired, but they can be moved from the classroom and changed by another professor, and that happened. All the professionals that achieved targets were awarded somehow, not necessarily with money, but there were uh, acknowledgement, and as I said, there was continuity in the policies. The Secretary of Education became the Secretary of the State of Ceará to implement that in the State of Ceará. It has improved. And we know that resources are not necessarily the, b the bottleneck. This is a sentence of the Secretary. Ten years have passed. We have spent the same percentage with uh, education, and we were able to make significant advances. If we have more resources, we can do more. But resources are not necessarily the bottleneck. Policies for basic education to improve management. Management is the big problem, especially the aspect of accountability. Who is responsible? Who is accountable for the performance of the students? Usually when the students have a bad performance, the, student, the teacher will blame the students, the family of the child, the system, the bad system that we have. Nobody looks at the problem and say, what can I do so that the student will learn more? 
it's interesting because the children will internalize that and the family will do it. Oh, my, fa my child is not studying enough. Nobody looks at the thing as a whole. How many classrooms were given? How, was the teacher there? Was he absent? What is the pedagogy or the didactics? These are things that are not analyzed. Apart from that, we have a problem in education. We do not have a unified standard CV. We have guidelines, but one day in Sao Paulo, schools are giving or ministering things totally different for the same subject, for the same year. We should increase the number of hours. We should invest in preschool. It should be more transparent, more mobilization of the families. The school responds for 20 or 30 percent of the learning, and families are responsible for the rest. And also try alternative systems. We experiment a little. Everything is locked up. Constitution is very strict. The models are strict. I think we could try alternative models, charter schools, the OSs that are already carried out in health. A school managed by the private sector with public resources. Let's make a tax, a test. Let's experiment with that. Let's see if it works. If it works, it could be extended. Talking about higher education, there was great expectations a few years ago to have enrollments that would achieve in 2012 12 million of people. That was the expectation, but it was around five, six million. The curve has grown much less than what was expected. Why? Basically, you have a bottleneck in high school. The conversion of fundamental school or elementary school to high school and from high school to the university is even lower. A few people will drop out and lots of them will not even go to high school. So high school is a great funnel. It's interesting because the return rates of higher school or higher education in Brazil are comparatively high, 15%, which is above the average of uh, OCDE. So if it's higher, people should look for higher education. But there is a problem. They don't go because you have a problem in high school, a learning problem in high school. In a higher school, you must have a certain set of skills and knowledge that are not given, so the bottleneck is really effective. If we look at the population between 15 and 17 years old, 10 million people, and we look at enrollment in high school, we have less than 2 million uh, students for a target population of 10. Of course, one is flow and the other one is stock. Actually, we have those who finish high school. One is the flow and the other one is stocks. But we should have a flow of students finishing high school a lot higher than that when we take into account the target population. And this is the conversion. Students that finish high school in the higher curve and those who are going to higher education, not necessarily the same population, but the number of enrollment in higher school. It has increased it, around 2007. It has stagnated, and it's growing again with a very significant growth. There was a coincidence with FIES, F -I -E -S, the financial the, or the funds for education. I believe there is a big correlation. It enabled students with no resources to enroll in higher education. That has a positive impact. The question is, what are the causes of the delay? 
If education is so good for society, for the individuals, why it has not been done in Brazil? If we look at the evolution in Brazil, the yellow bar, it has improved. But in, compared to other countries, other countries improved a lot more, even our neighbors. These are years of schooling for those who were born in those years. Brazil, for those who were born in 1930, had a few years, 2.5 years. Those who were born in the 70s, it was six something. So other countries evolved much more. If we look at Chile, it went from 4.5 to 11, and so on and so forth. So we are lagging behind. We're moving, but we are slow. When we look at the causes and why countries focused on education, we have two reasons. One is theological and the other one is ideological. Theological is interesting because in the Protestant countries, the relation between uh, the faithful and God is direct. So people should read the Bible to have a relationship. So reading the Bible was disseminated in all the Protestant countries. In the Catholic religion, there is an intermediate, which is the Catholic Church. So the relationship between God and the clary and in the individual. So the individual did not have to read. The clarymen should read, so they could read the Bible, but individuals not necessarily needed to do it. That was uh, an explanation for the education in the Protestant countries until the 19th century, approximately. If we look at Germany, Scotland, England, and the United States, Scandinavian, in 1949, 80% of people had lit were literate already. In Prussia, 70%. In England, the levels in Spain, Portugal, France were a lot lower than that. Another reason was an ideological reason. In France, all the education process started after the French Revolution. There was a, rep a republic, you had to educate the people, they had to break the power of the church who educated people. They needed a federal education that was universal for the whole population. If we look at Japan, education had two big drivers in the era of, of uh, Tokugawa to provide respect the Confucius, Confucians, uh, drivers of family, respect for and obedience to authority. When we look at the Meiji era, there was a big change. And we saw the focus on obedience to the em emperor. In the communist countries, it was a doctrine thing to create the new man. And you may have anchors that may encourage countries to invest more in education. Korea, for example, it was uh, the, under the domain of Japan, so the, there was China on the other side. So we must develop, we must educate with the geopolitical reasons. When they entered the European community, they also made a huge effort in Spain and Portugal because there was an anchor, the European community. In Latin America, we had opposite things. We had Sarmiento, who started a public education system in, in Argentina. He was the president of Argentina. He was from a middle-class origin, but he was convinced that education was extremely important, and he started a process in Argentina that was already a little better than Brazil. In 1958, we had 7,020 students in 31 schools in Rio de Janeiro with 360,000 people and 6,900 students in Buenos Aires with a population with 120,000 people. 
when Sarmiento was president, he promoted a, an education universal system and put 100,000 children in school. And Argentina advanced a lot more in education than Brazil. As a paradox, uh, Dom Pedro II was uh, intellectual, he spoke many languages, but he did nothing for the Brazilian education. So we have other causes, uh, polit politics, uh, businessmen in the past, not so much today, but they thought education was not that important because we could train people. There were several discussions in the 80s by Brazilian leaders that said that. Why should we educate? They come and we train them. They are trained to operate a machine. If he leaves that company and goes somewhere else, there is no use for him. The fact is that the Brazilian system, as it, it was a closed economy, it, it worked well, relatively well. Why change then? What happened? There was technological changes in the world. There were changes in Brazil. Only 20% of the population voted in 1960, the last free election before the military coup. Today, 70% of the population votes. So the political situation changed completely. Education became a media topic. You see the the education of the media on this subject, Ch things are changing, are evolving. Examples such as Korea and Sobral show that we can change faster if there is, there is willingness to do it. Con political continuity, accountability to obtain results, which is the most important in education. Before I finish, I would like to talk about the fund Perfim Educar and its impact in the school. We have a scholarship program in the school with several targets. We want to accept any student who has academic capacity regardless of assets or income. This is extremely important. We, ha we are a non-profit institution and this is one of our most important ambitions. We want to disseminate knowledge for all those who have a ability or skills. And we want to attract people from lower income to increase diverse, uh, the diverse of our diversity of our faculty and our students. So we want to have at least 10% of students in graduation programs with a scholarship. Today we have 132 uh, scholarship holders, 110 had, uh, or 22 of them had a whole scholarship refundable with the, a very soft manner to reimburse the school. We, the, this number of uh, scholarship holders has increased a lot, and this is a fund that is fed by 1% of the income of graduation, restitution or reimbursement of scholarship holders, and donations. Last year, we went over the target. We achieved 1,080,000, and today we have, again, a target of uh, 1,000,000. And the Perfing Fund was responsible for 202 and 500, 202 million and 500 reais, and is responsible for five full scholarships for our students. These are, the, these are the faces of our students. So we have a face in the communication. I thank you deeply, Jose Roberto. I uh, thank the Perfin Fund for your help to the school. It's been fundamental. Thank you very much.
just a second while I find my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank Claudio and the uh, INSPIR team to, for helping us to organize the first briefing day, to thank the speakers who are going to participate of our event and all of you for your participation. In the last seven years, Berfin was able to achieve uh, lots of things, endowment, client basement, fun pension funds, institutes, family offices, multifamily offices. It, that is all very important for us because when we compare what we were in 2007 and when Beto and I became partners and we started that in 2004. Apart from that, the wealth management area growth led our company to continue to grow and to have a sustainability. And of course, we faced some uh, difficult times. And of course, this is going to continue. Perfin is stronger as an institution. Always with the goal of have an improvement in terms of process, people, systems. We are increasing our management team. Uh, we are hiring new partners and analysts. We believe in the partnership policy, so everyone that join our group, they need to have the profile to become uh, partners in the medium and uh, short term. And we are also implementing a new rating company that we believe necessary and, and implemented systems. We are leaving Excel that always has more uh, risk and we are going to f systems to front, middle and back office. We are uh, adapting ourselves to rules of FATCA, dot Frank and AMFD. Here is the view, how is the pits of our uh, customers base. We are showing fundings and partners that we have. Uh, we want to show how it was in 2007, but those who invested with us back then, I would like to thank them. I think they were quite uh, frightening because it was, it seemed we were discovering the world. The pie today is more diversified and it supports more the work we are developing. Here is the history, our growth history, asset growth system in terms of management, asset management both in equity and wealth management areas. In general, the growth is around 60% for both business units. Nothing would be possible if we, we do not have a partnership uh, uh, policies, uh, partners align, partners that understand our work, they support and give us times for business to mature. Here's the, our return history, our performance history we have for each fund. So if we look the long short strategy, our return is around 14%. And this is the fund that we ended up creating a branch for Perfin Educa in the long short plus, which is twi we have twice the risk. We have a return of 12% a year for both funds. We have an alpha above 4% and 3% respectively since the beginning with volatility over control. When we look our product long only, which is a very important focus for international and foreign 
investments that allow us to have this long-term view for investments with our companies and for portfolio, we can observe a return of 19% and an alpha around 25% a year for the fund. What I, I would like to talk how the company is organized, uh, where uh, business is intensive in people and not uh, currency and money. We are intensive on partners for the construction of the business. Today we have more than 12 partners. Uh, that are, are with us for more than three, three years. We hope to increase this on a yearly base. For us, it's very important, the returns. We have no Zuckberger in our group, so return. We need to improve processes, systems, and partners that are aligned and add and contribute, not on their specific areas, but in all areas the company performs. Qualitative aspect is very important in the evaluation and in the development of these partners. We also created two years ago, this is an old idea that we have, but we implemented a consulting board that put the consist that where, where we have Darcy Goldfarb, Bill Luis Claro Garcia de Souza, Luis Oliveira Pereira, and Rodney McLaughlin. The goal of this consulting board that meets every three months, but uh, they have a monthly contact, is to give more white hair to our team. Our team is a very young team, so we would validate not only investment theses and discussions, but validate internal processes for the management of partnership that is very important according to our conception. Today, we have older people and, so, and we have lots of bold people as well. But uh, the development and growth of these board this board is adding more and more to our team, so it makes sense to maintain this and find the correct members that have interest and participate and expand this consulting board or advisory board, better saying. Another point is that uh, despite the c company being created as a club, Many partners from the club, only Beth and myself are still members, but we have very important partners in the company. They are active partners, and we are today a partnership because uh, the owner, the larger owner, has 22,000 percent. Uh, we have the consensus and we need the consensus and approval of all partners. Here I need to talk about per, uh, perspective. I will let this to be talked about member companies, their forecast for their segments. Uh, we could not have all companies that we have in our portfolio, but we understand that in the future, all these company uh, will uh, participate in this event. We understand today that we have a challenging scenario, binary events like election, uh, blackout, uh, the U.S. These are micro and macro factors. These are not our expertise. That's why we try to focus and get far from this uh, uh, kind of events. What we see today in our portfolio, uh, you'll be able to see today a sectorial diversification, but always seeking company with an interesting internal rate of uh, return with the, its own uh, growing dynamic without a great a dependency on the government to remain and maintain interesting returns. Uh, many companies have a pressing power that are very good. They are able of uh, including infra inflation. It's a, it, this is very important in Brazil. We see today in our portfolio uh, for the next three years, an internal rate of return above our capital cost forecasted for the period. 
we have uh, equity risk in our portfolio above five to six percent. Historically, this is a required level to invest on uh, stocks. Uh, we continue and understand the challenging dynamic we face today. We are trying to improve our capital allocation to improve and maximize return. But for us, what's really important is to invest in company with a high attractivity level, with a larger security margin that face different scenarios in Brazil. Once uh, I've heard the CEO of a big group say, if I look only crisis in Brazil to invest, I would have done nothing in my company. And my company, Multiplan, is a leading company in the segment. Iguatemi may have the same mindset. And we understand uh, a little about this. Capital cost in Brazil is very high. Investors' participation on variable income is low. But this is a dynamic. When we look at long-term horizon, this is a favorable dynamic to invest in some companies that we have in our uh, portfolio. Now, I would like to invite Mario Gil to talk about the educational sector that uh, Claudio Adagi mentioned. Good morning. Uh, the second attempt, good morning. Uh, I studied on prep uh, schools. I really like a very cheerful audience. I have some students here. Zé Roberto used to study with me. He studied chemical with me. That's when he decided to study administration and not chemical. So he did a, a right, the right cho choice in life. I would like to thank the invitation, especially in this house where I studied and did my MBA to meet Claudio. is really nice. I'm always available to talk about education or specifically about a brief education. Cloud, you really make my life very easy. One of the challenge of talking of a business is if we have a clear opportunity. Challenges in Brazil in education is so big that the other side of the coin is the opportunities that we have in business related to education to solve this huge problem Brazil faces. Cloud, you thank you very much for your presentation. I do not need to concentrate concentrate on this, on the fact to have coverage during your education. We need to improve education in this country. Here I mention an information cloud you gave. This data, this slide dates back to one year ago, but Brazil was going towards being the fifth largest economy in the world, but we are at the tip of the educational results. There is. The PISA is exams is particularly interesting. I would like to explain what PISA is. Methodology of PISA is really interesting. They do not get students who graduated. They have a transversal cut or for 15 years students. At that age, the schooling level is equivalent to 30 years of other countries that uh, did the same test. So PISA results is really relevant to show that our education as a country is really bad. And here's just a snapshot. If we see the complete film, the, the more countries join PISA, they speed up and grow faster than Brazil. We are behind, but our capacity to speed up is really limited. Uh, Claudio mentioned Claudio Renato. I have the honor to work with him and to be partner in an evaluation schooling system in school. And we discovered, uh, we uh, analyzed the state of Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Rio, Sao Paulo, Espírito Santo, involving thousands of students and one million teachers. We discovered that variable of resources to have very little impact. So the summary you presented, what makes no difference? It makes no difference teachers' wage. This was known internationally. 
it's almost like protected. If you invest in the system, focusing on salaries, what you ripe as a result is very small. But when you can do this with the right teachers, meritocracy is key. If I if I invest more on the right teacher, the educational system will react. But here it's very difficult in Brazil due to ideology, unions, and so forth. But we discovered that process variables are the key ones. Brazil pays attention on resources variable and do not pay attention on process variables. We, we, we need to have libraries. We, we have evaluated states that have labs, lab, library, but they were closed. Otherwise, students with uh, damage uh, the books and computers. Keep this information. It seemed a lost information in my presentation. Process variables are key because I will use this in the future. However, Brazil made the decision to invest more in the educational world. In the left, right hand, uh, side graph, we have 5.8 of the GDP being invested on education. As you know, we have um, a willingness. Uh, it's not a law. It's not regulated uh, as yet. But until the end of this decade, 10% of our GDP will be invested in, our, in education. This is more than the investment of other development uh, countries. Germany is 5.8, France 5.1, uh, Great Britain 6.5. So we will invest more in education than many other development, developed countries. And here is the risk. On, if, on the one hand, for a company on the educational area, this is a nice place to get uh, acquire revenues. We go back. Resources is not the problem. The problem is lack of process that guarantee that these resources will uh, improve uh, uh, learning process. This is pragmatism introduced by Paulo Renato with an economic approach. He wanted to discover why some schools work and others don't, and they with a focus of an economist. And this is quite prevailing today on the left on the left right hand side on the bottom growth of investment on basic education is greater than it education and government investments in the higher education. This is good. As Claudio mentioned, Sobral, a small city in the state of Ceará that uh, ripe uh, very good fruits, bet on this. Sobral created something called PIKE, which is a pact for education at the right age. And this created a uh, PNID program, which is a national program. We know the problem lies on elementary schools. When kids start to learn how to read and write, we can guarantee for the citizen an academic and solid life in the future. This motivates federal government to invest and to invest more on elementary school more than they do and focus on higher education. On this slide, I would like to talk about Abril ed Education, the first strategic we decision we need to, to, to focus. Our focus is K-12. to uh, Elementary school, uh, we can consider everything that includes elementary school, higher school, professional courses, everything that we call basic education. This is our addressable market. It's quite diversified basic education in Brazil. We have a laser pointer here, right? It's the green one, right? So we have technical schools, language courses, preparatory courses, like uh, entrance 
schools for universities, publishers, learning systems. I will talk about this. This is one of the solutions for the Brazilian education. And the 45 billions of annual revenue or GDP of basic education in Brazil. This is in tuition, school tuitions. Uh, middle class in Brazil has today on the school its second large expenditure. First, to buy a house, the second, which used to be called now is education, and the third largest investment for families is the car. Second is education. It's growing uh, between classes D plus and C minus. So part of this 45 billion is concentrated on tuition and less than the more, the less than half percent of the market is focused on promoting courses and content for basic education. So we have a huge space to grow. And if we compare with higher education, we mentioned that on basic school, we talk about 51 million students that can be affected by at least one product of Abril education. Our sample is huge. 51 million students is the number of students on K-12, on technical training, high school language training. This is 8.2 times larger than the number of students on higher education in Brazil. So the first strategic decision was to position and focus on basic education. We have lots of invitation to focus on higher education, and we made this decision. We want to continue on this market due to its size, and because we understand that it's on the base that we can contribute for a higher improvement in education, and therefore an improvement in the country. I was taking notes while Claudio was talking, and I think it's interesting to talk to you that education is not a discussion between peers. I work in this area for 26 years. I always talked about education, but currently education is in the agenda of society. And business people come to talk how we can improve education in a city or munici municipality. We serve many small cities, and they say, I give up. I do not want to manage this network of teachers alone. I need someone with a methodology that can help me make this work, because I invest a lot in this, but I do not ripe any result. But it's interesting to see that many, many times municipalities come after us through a private ins institution. They look, they come to Abril Educação together with the mayor to say we need to mobilize to improve education. I can mention the city of Barretos. We work with all students in the municipality with our, one of our brands, Anglo de Ensino. The mayor decided to do something because the society claimed for this. Either we improve productivity of our labor market in Barretos, or Barretos won't have any industry in the long term. And this goes hand in hand with a study conducted by Exame that is published by Abril Media. We are different companies. We have the uh, same uh, controllers, and my, but we have different minority shareholders. Abril Educação, it's a listed company. Abril Media is not listed, but we talk naturally uh, about with our co-brothers. And we focus on a very interesting work, if you have this magazine, but after Claudio's presentation, you will see what the magazine tries to promote is that Brazilian productivity will improve when we improve education of the Brazilian labor uh, hand. This is making the business community 
to give hands to work towards education. And this goes hand in hand with our desire to be in this educational segment. For any company to succeed, we need to define which are success factors that are really relevant. A company today has the opportunity to do many, many things. We need to identify what makes difference and focus on these elements. I want to focus on Steve Jobs. He has a nice saying. He was really a, a, a pain in the ass, but he left some legacy to the world, not only the company, but also some legacy for business people. He said he was much more proud of what he did not do than what he had done. This shows that competition is absurd. We can do lots of things, but to define the four or five we need to do, state of the art, it's a challenge to any businessman. In education, one size does not fit all. This is a conviction of and a creed of Abril education. It's impossible that a, a huge country, such di a diversified country as Brazil, to have one single product addressing part of the market. In our educational system area that I will define, education system is like uh, something like a fruit that we only have in Brazil. I try to explain what's a schooling system. You know the brands, you learn Anglo, Objetivo, Positivo. All these are a schooling system, education system. This is a very brave decision. This is what we miss in our public area. It's a very brave educational decision to gather a group of people that define a methodology that delivers this methodology through a didactic and pedagogic material. What do we do on the first day of class, on the second, third day of class, when we have tests? How tests will be assessed? How can we compare with our students? How these comparisons will be reports that teachers may improve their classes for the owner of the school to learn that that teacher is the one that contributes less for the education of the student all this is based on a calendar. This is a system of education. On the other hand, many of you studied on school with uh, didactic books. Many Brazilian schools adopt this methodology. But this methodology has a problem. The Democr pedagogic democracy is fantastic, but we, it requires good teachers. If we have good teachers, democracy on how to work works. If we have poor teachers, we can't give to this person the right to choose. On the other hand, he should be guided to have all support to improve its performance. Here, you need to rescue the information I mentioned on the first slide. Do you remember variables of resources or variable of processes? Variables of processes. The system does not deliver the material. They deliver a methodology, a methodology of education, of learning, with all that must be done to work. So, Abril Education already understood that in 2010, even 2009, Abril Education was the spin-off of Abril Media. It left Abril Media with two companies, uh, Archica and Sibioni Publishers, and they uh, opened that. So, didactic books, not necessarily are a long-term solution for Brazil. We must understand what the players of the education system are doing because they will reap better results than the didactic book. In 2010, we invested in Anglo, the acquisition of the course and the learning process, and we set up a portfolio of six 
uh, teaching systems focused on a certain segment of the Brazilian market of private schools and some of them also in the public sector. That's just to give you an example that to face the challenge of ed education, we must have a broad portfolio, a single product or a single approach will not guarantee your life in the markets that's so diversified. Another interesting point is that in education, reputation is uh, has more value than in other markets. So we made a strategic decision in the past, and I believe that we have been consistent to the strategy, and we have a great barrier for our opponents. I will mention who they are, but we should have the better brands. At Brill Education spent a lot of money and invested a lot buying the best brands in the markets we wanted to work. I mentioned Anglo, PH in the schools, which is the Rio de Janeiro Anglo. We bought a school in Brasilia, which is the best school in the name, Sigma, Motivo in Pernambuco, other inter uh, interesting uh, systems. When we decided to enter the, I the language uh, market, we invested in Red Balloon, which is the best brand of uh, English teaching for children, wh which is when it should be taught. Then we also understood that the best brand of English for professional youngs, uh, young adults, all that is related to the first challenge. If we have a broad portfolio, and that's key for the company to be successful in basic education, to have the best brand is the best way for the market to recognize you and for you to be a barrier of entrance for the next ones. One of the big uh, com uh, competitors is Pearson with the which works in Brazil since 2007, when they bought three teaching systems from SEBI. Coqui, Dom Bosco, and Pueridomus. At that point, in 2007 until 2013, they were one our competitors in schools with teaching systems and they have acquired multi to teach languages. So there are strategies that are getting closer. Pearson has followed some strategies of Abril Educação, but we understand that the best brands, the reputation that's consolidated is our competitive differential in the short, medium and long term. Other important points that are key to our strategic decisions and that will justify the growth of the company. Children should be more time in school. This is something Claudio also mentioned, but he called it classroom hours. The more number of hours, the more the child will learn. I would like to say that there is a social movement that's in favor of education. Apart from all the concern about improvement, which is the movement of the maids that has no relation to education but we know that in all schools we manage in the thousands of schools that are our partners families have decided that it's more expensive to have a maid in your house for a longer time they prefer to spend that money in school so schools will have their children for a longer period of time so everything that Brazil does today to improve the stay of child in school is important for improving results of education, but also for economic reasons for the families. That's what they want. And we have anticipated, we have worked ahead of that trend. And I will show you what are our approaches for kids to stay longer in school. Cross sales, complementary products, and also adaptive learning. Guys, cross sales and complementary products is one thing. Adaptive learning is the frontier that the world has for technology to contribute to education in a relevant manner. I mentioned to you that I have worked in this market for 26 years. I started teaching. In those 26 years, I've heard that the school was going to die uh, several times. 
when internet appeared, everybody said, well, internet is going to kill school because access to knowledge has not to be mediated by the institution. Well, internet has been in the market for 20 years and school has not died. I also heard that the notebook was going to kill the school because, you know, if I have internet and I have a notebook, I have connection, I have access anywhere, well, notebook is there and school has not died. Then, netbook and all the debate about who's going to kill the school, it became a debate about the tablet. Now, tablet will do it. Now, tablet will do the job. It will kill the school because people make a jump or they they take a leap between what happened in music and what happens in the education industry. And several investors have that doubt. Where are we going to invest in education companies? Look at the technology, what they're doing to music, to media. Are we investing in a, on a horse that's going to be killed by tablet? No. Careful with that reasoning. In school, we have a unique thing. The student doesn't go to school to consume content. They go to school to achieve a degree, to get a degree. It's the only institution responsible socially to deliver a diploma. Nobody will bypass the school. That's fundamental. If you have doubts if technology is going to bypass or to kill institutions, no. The school will give a diploma to the student. The whole chain of music, well, the CD stores were uh, different. I am the time. I'm from the time where we had uh, discs, where we had. Well, I never bought a CD in my life. My nephew said, "I still find it advanced." I confess to you that a CD is very advanced. My 20-year-old nephew never bought a CD. He always downloaded music through the internet. This is not going to kill the school environment. The CD store would not add value. I had to go there. It was an intermediate. They took a part of the value of the chain. So it was eliminated by iTunes or other strategies because it would not add value. Nobody eliminates the school. There is no risk. So the educational market is very solid, very sound in relation to what technology may or uh, bring or not to the final user, to the end user and the family. On the other hand, I may shock you, every school lies. Every school lies. I was a, your teacher and I lied to you. You never heard it because you were talking all the time during my classes. He was a brilliant student. But if I had a heart attack, it would be the next teacher because they would not find out. They were talking to the next guy. I'm just joking. Say. But the school lies. Everybody knows you have a child. You choose the school based on the promise that your child is not going to be a number. He was going to be someone. And the school is looking at whom in a differentiated manner. Beto. You call him Beto, right? When Beto enrolled, someone promised his family that he was going to be looked at uh, in a special manner. But the school is a collective effort. I was uh, director of his school. We put Beto in a classroom with 39 other students, and he became one fortieth uh, focus of the school attention. That's the intrinsic lie of the school. It promises a personalized learning, but it's only a collective effort. Then technology works. All what I, of what I've said is, ends up at the mature role of technology is no longer entertaining the student. Billions of dollars have been spent in the last five years trying to transform educational contents into entertaining contents, texts into videos, exercises into games, and all that has not proven any improvement in academic results, even in countries where this has advanced. I would like to mention 
a singular example. In Catalonia, in Spain, in 2008, the province of Catalonia in Spain abolished the didactic books and started to invest all they had in technological resources, videos, animations, games. It, they created an expression that it's called edutainment, education plus ed entertainment, gamification, fantastic show. Three years later, the students of Catalonia had results 30% lower than the results of Spain, which showed that when you use technology to entertain, the student will spend more time than he thinks interesting, not necessarily what is necessary for his education, because some things require jo uh, an effort to gain muscles, to w lose weight, takes time. There is no shortcuts. So adaptive learning, learning from my origins, right? Uh, adaptive learning is very modern, is where we are investing our efforts to extract this intrinsic lie. Each student will learn in their own pace. The idea is simple. Students are continuously evaluated, technology, enables us to that. We don't have to wait for PISA, for Saeb, for a name. Every single day, students make their homeworks, answer the exercises, and they are compared to th hundreds of thousands of students, and we ad identify who's lagging behind, who is moving ahead, and the next homeworks of that student is, are adapt to that student again. If Beto show difficulties in chemistry, his next homeworks are not those planned for the average schools. They are going to be planned for him. Recuperation exercises. If I did not understand what is a fraction column in the book, I will show Beto a video of this column of oil fractioning. You were a good, right? before you were my student. Well, I'm just joking. So the video of that column is a technological resource, a learning object will make sense to him because it's addressing a gap that he showed in his evaluation. This is a struggle among educators. The object of learning in itself is not good or not bad. It depends. If I show that object to the right student at the right moment, addressing the right gap, that object is fantastic. If I do the opposite, it has no use. A clear example. In our Anglo course, we approve 70 or 80 percent of our students for medical schools in Pinheiros and Paulista, the best schools. For those guys, the top guys, to show an animation about the circulatory system has no sense. They know it by heart. I don't have that right. To show an animation about this system makes sense to those who did not understand how it works. This is adaptive learning. This is going to mean the qualitative leap in education, not only in Brazil, but in the world. Of course, our company is able to deliver an adaptive learning platform faster than other countries because, I know I have only 10 minutes, because we have made brave decisions in Brazil. In Abril Education, we have 600 and uh, 605 uh, uh, students who study in private schools who, who are our partners. 650,000 sc students use our methodology. A, B, C, the first class from the third, the second, everything is planned. Those 650,000 students mean dozens of data, millions of data a day. So we are setting up a whole big data that will enable us to find which is the best solution of adaptive learning for each one of the students. Because we have a 
a learning system. On the other end, Americans are trying to develop adaptive learning platforms based on books that were chosen by the teachers. So if you look at the neighborhood of New York, School A uses a CV or a curriculum, or there is a trend of having a common curriculum. But a certain school in a certain neighborhood in Brooklyn uses a set of books. The other school uses other books. If you compare students that use books completely different, and the teachers are in different chapters, to discover if this student is better than that one is very hard. That's why educational comparisons are made at the end of the cycle, end of the elementary one, or elementary two, when you have hundreds of thousands of students in your system using the same methodology that's comparable every single day. We are able to produce comparisons faster than anyone else. So. I would like to comment with you that that's why municipalities have adopted learning systems instead of the didactic book that it e they even receive for free from the federal government. It's interesting to mention that. Every public school receives books from the federal government in a program that was implemented by Paulo Renato in 95 that will deliver millions of books to public schools. Once again, the variable of resources has no effect. The entry of the didactic book did not improve substantially our education. How is this book being used? Process variables will effectively lead to improvement or not. In the learning systems, I will mention Barretos. The Barretos mayor decided that I don't want the books from the federal government because they come. Nobody explains to my teacher how to use the book. It's not enough to deliver the chemical, the chemistry book. But sometimes he's a biology teacher to try to teach chemistry, so we have to teach him chemistry. Nobody is brave enough to have integrated evaluations, so the, re the recipe does not interest me. I don't want that book, and I'm going to pay for the learning systems. So they are paying for those systems within their budgets because they believe that this methodology, the process, is much more productive and will lead to better results. It's also very interesting, Claudio, that you brought the data because we have measured that training teachers does not solve the problem. Or better saying, trainings that are offered currently to teachers will not solve the problems because they're not brave trainings. Today, in all the states of Brazil and in education, colleges, all that's offered to the teachers are several trades of psychology, of philosophy, all based on an ideology that's totally debatable, and they have no idea of what they're going to do in the first class. They have no idea if they should use the board, for example, the blackboard, to communicate with the students. This kind of training will not produce improvements. I always say that if you talk about Vallon, Vigot, and Piaget, forget it. They will not improve at all. But if you are brave enough to say, Professor, forget everything you saw about ideology and trends. Let's learn how to give a classroom. Let's talk, learn how to write well, to explain to the student correctly the algorithm of addition, division, multiplication. Let's be brave to make the decisions that make sense. The leap is huge, Claudio. When we focus the training on the practice of the classroom, we will reap evident results of quality in education. That's what the learning systems do. Also, it's important to our industry. Honestly, we are low capex. There's not much money to invest 
in our publishers, it's not the quality of impression that will make a difference. It's the quality of people. It's a people-based industry. To have the best team with a solid culture will mean a differential in the competition. Talking about our strategy, I do not have data for 2010, but 100% of revenues from Abril Education, I know it's difficult to see here, 100% of our company came from two publishers, Atica and Ciprione. Three years later, we have Atica Ciprione corresponding to 40% of our revenue in the division of uh, learning systems, it represents one-fourth division of own schools, 20% and 10% of our revenue last year came from language courses with investments in YZIP and Red Balloon for 2014. And in the long term, we'll have publishers corresponding to one third of our revenue uh, learning system one third and focus on language schools the other one third. Our EBITDA grew in a compound way, 23% since, sorry, can you check the data, 2012? But this is more interesting to compare pro forma. It takes into account that language areas, we bought a wise up last year, this is part of the EBITDA. So the more interesting slide is pro forma that show trends in the markets we operate. If languages were included in the year 2013, we would have learning system growing in EBITDA a lot because it shows pragmatism of private and public schools in Brazil. Public schools do not use traditional uh, didactic books. We lost 4.1 EBITDA in publishing this year. Didactic books where the power lies on the hands of teachers do not produce results. Learning systems that methodology is analyzed by specialists that apply by teachers produces results. That's why this division is growing so much. And in the future, both the area of language and own schools will gain substantial importance in our portfolio. The drivers of growth. I mentioned before, which are the opportunities. Organic growth, since we assume Kager, organic Gager is around 30% organic growth. So we face no difficulties to grow our business, own schools, learning systems. We, we are studying acquisition opportunities. We are in all target markets. We still uh, need some relevant presence, like people from Sao Paulo mentioning Anglo, know about Anglo, but the inhabitants from Rio, they do not know the brand. So to, develop, to implement in Rio, Anglo school would be very difficult. That's why we bought PH, a very good school in Brazil. We launched uh, a content, a PH content, and we are growing in, in Rio. That's the same strategy we are applying for Northeast and Southeast. We are going to buy some schools. Opera uh, schooling operations are really profitable, and we leverage le value with this approach. In education systems, uh, we grow, we have organic growth, but one third is on the hand of small players who are dying because they cannot invest in new technologies. So it is most likely that we'll consolidate uh, teaching systems to have a leading uh, and comfortable position. Synergies and cross-selling. I will move to the last slide, which is my personal challenge. I am responsible for everything that is not language, so pedagogic content, several products. They used to be product lines in the past, and today this is my challenge today. Publishers, Etica and Ciprione, they compete with our teaching system. So 
I had uh, sellers going to sell uh, books from Scipioni, and uh, a, a, a salesperson from Editora Attica was saying bad things about uh, our other line. So we decided that our focus is the customers. I have teachers and schools to serve. The relationship with school can start with a learning system or a didactic book. The most interesting is Crossell, the same school that has idle time in the afternoon or at night. Maybe that school may have a preparation course for, uh, for civil servants or a preparatory course for NN. We can supply the material or uh, distance learning. So in on that school that I already have a partnership, I diversify the service with other service from our company. So technical courses now with Pronatec, which is the financial federal financial is exploding. And those who are going to capitalize our schools and basic schools will supply a technical system for both channel. This semester, every two students for Pronatec uses Abril Education material. Another point is language courses. Remember, I mentioned employees or house maids a problem. F families want their kids on school, so this is the alternative. The mother will pick up his her son in the school and take him to a language course. We want to change them. We want the school to offer this possibility at cheaper price. So this is the core of our technology for languages. We identified that among our partner schools, we'll have 760 opportunities of Red Balloon franchisees only in the schools that we have in this year of 2014. And finally, I would like to mention that Brazilian school is the last area of capitalism where business administration is not important. It's come step after step. Now is the time that Brazilian schools are beginning to be uh, a concern to, to have management software, support to marketing, to face its legal issues. These are opportunities we have because we already have a leadership position uh, in the schools in Brazil. We have all our services we offer in this area. These are great opportunities for cross Therefore, we can increase our revenue and margins in this market. I think I just need to mention something uh, very brief. It's a leader in me. It's an American project to create values in, in, the, ki in the kids. But we, we adapt this for kids, and we have very positive uh, results. We are surfing a different wave, which is to be pragmatic. Parents say education, uh, school do not education. Fa and we say the following. The kids need to be educated. So let's introduce the best program to contribute with this. That's the goal of leading in me. We have Chinese uh, growth. We'll double customers' base in the future because it's the time to find more temp of kids in school, families we ha that have no time to educate their kids, and schools that now have a methodology to help these families and kids. Well, that's what I was able to, to tell you in the period I was allowed. Uh, I, I would like to present our strategic decision why social variables are really favorable to this portfolio. And finally, which is our vision? 
Today, Abril Educação, it's a complete company that wants to offer to the, its partner schools a complete service. Okay, I think that's it. We have a time for Q&A, although I am over time. There is no time for a Q&A, so you have no right to ask anything because we do not have time. Thank you for your, for your attention. Well, unfortunately, during coffee break, if Gio is here, we have one-on-one -on -one conversations. I will invite Carlos and Chris to come here. Now, we, Iguatemi is going to talk about the area of shopping centers. Good morning. I am Cristina Bet. I'm CFO from Iguatemi. I will do a very short presentation. Uh, I hope we have time for Carlos to answer your questions. Let's talk about what we are doing since the company's IPO, talk about the forecast for this year's onward, what we have inaugurated recently in our pipeline of projects. Well, let's cover briefly about Iguatemi. It's a company with a portfolio of 15 shopping malls, one outlet in Novemberg, and three commercial towers. It's a clear strategy. We also talk about being focused on A, B income classes and fo uh, concentrated in the south and southeast. One of the characteristics of uh, Iguatemi is the brand. If you ask anyone, anyone on the street what's uh, Iguatemi it it's um, it's uh, known and acknowledged as quality we have a very strong pipeline in our projects and with a solid growth rate I'll cover it now in in a while so talking about our history, Iguatemi has a long history. As we are today, it was purchased. It was purchased in 1979, and it was the time to create this brand, this portfolio, which was the base of this growth. Recently, the history of company 2007 was the first one to open. Uh, to become listed, uh, we have a primary uh, ca uh, capitalization, and we started uh, doing acquisition of malls. We bought uh, several malls and several stakes in the existing portfolio, which is Galeria in Campinas, Esplanada in Sorocaba. They suffered some expansions and other investments. And this was a cycle of one and a half years. Everybody opened capitals, people started buying, and prices were completely distorted. And we were the first one to change strategy and look to a different way of growth, seeking new opportunities of green fields and some expansions. It was also a period that uh, we, after Lehman Brothers crisis, when we looked our uh, sector in general, January 2009, it was a very atypical uh, uh, month trying to understand what was re happening. We had a possibility to speed up what we had in pipeline. That's when we started a new raising and follow on in 2009 to have a balance and funds to invest in a more aggressive ways on this growth, or in this organic growth of the company. And we start to deliver a new pipeline of projects. We have Iguatemi Brasilia, Iguatemi Brasilia, JK, Alphaville, and some shoppings in the interior of Sao Paulo, Rio, Ribeirão Preto, Sorocraba, and now Rio Preto. And with this, 
we have this new moment of uh, growth. I'll talk about what's our focus. Our focus was to look to profitability of our projects, to have um, the highest revenue per square meter. So, so we have an expressive growth in uh, square meters. We went from uh, 121 to 380 last year, a growth of 18% a year of uh, square meters. But when you go down in our panel, what it represents in terms of profit and revenue, we see this shows the profitability we included and gave to our portfolio. We are growing, but we are growing with more uh, GLA, improving the proficiency of our portfolio. We have revenues of 23%, a bit of uh, 30% a year. And if we look here per square meter, a Kiger of 10% and per share of 17% a year. How do we do this? This is the question. We have three levers of growth to grow with profitability our square meters. One is implementing uh, uh, quality green fields. We had one of our, we designed the values of the company. One of the eight values is wow, to be great. There's no wow in the shopping center. Something is wrong and we, we need, it needs improvement. So we need to find fantastic places in the best areas. So our shoppings will show to you what it means in terms of revenue per square meters. To talk about uh, current assets, not only launching, we have a team focus on development of new business, but as a team that follow up the existing shopping centers, the existing assets to make them more productive with new stores, new services, not let the uh, equipment to get old, so trying to refurbish and update our equipment. Uh, we are not considered as a big player in terms of acquisition, but we are doing selective acquisitions, so we need to to do selective acquisition to improve our portfolio that we know and believe. So talk about the green fields we have implemented. If we look revenue per square meter in the year 2013, if we looked uh, shoppings we have in our portfolio during the IPO, we are talking about an average revenue of GLA of we sold one shopping all this time, one shopping in Rio. It, was, it did not fit in our strategy of location, a social economic focus. So this shopping here had a 687 profitability per square meter. But what's important is to see what we have implemented, what we have between Brasilia, Alphaville, JK, the price per square meter was 1.8 thousand reais per square meters. With the new shoppings, we are all able to have shoppings producing more than double of our revenue. So that's how we plan to keep growing. Talking about the existing assets, if we look, we have shop, different shoppings, maturing shoppings, mature shoppings like Iguatemi, which was the first shopping center built in Latin America. We look what we are grow, growing, looking from 2007 to 2013. We are talking about of growth, a Kiger growth of 8% nominal, 3 4% real a long six to seven years. So this is an expressive growth to a mature portfolio like ours. And shoppings with a long history, like Campinas growing 10%, Iguatemi, Sao Paulo, that is growing 7%. It's quite a challenge. So we have different shoppings with a good uh, profitability, something that highlights so we can understand what is apple per apple, so we deduct from total. 
things that are fantastic in our portfolio, but uh, commercial towers that we have on market play, they are 100% rented with good prices, but the kind of revenue they produce are, is different. They have no ancillary revenues like parking, temporary location, and so forth. And other things like our power center in front of Campinas, where we have a 30,000 sque square meter area with a tox stock, a supermarket. This is not the same product. So we deduct this and we you see three, five, seven percent parts of shoppings we already have. That's a pulverization of assets. If we think that we have assets that are more mature, we have this uh, pulverization, families that pass to their heirs, physical persons that have participations, and in time they monetize to invest in more liquid things. The most interesting thing here is on the other hand, on the other side, these are our shopping malls. The blue part is what we have, our share of the shoppings, and the gray what we don't have of our shoppings. So if we add all we don't have, this is a theoretical potential of 200,000 square meters of acquisitions. That's still a target for us to buy in time. Talking about what we're going to do in the future, as we've heard in the previous presentation, it's important to know what we do not want to do, what we're not going to do, and focus on what we want. We want to grow in the economic uh, tier where we are. There is room for that, the growth of the disposable income of the AB classes is still very attractive, and it will be in the coming years. And we want to focus on that segment and south and southeast, where is the concentration and where we can leverage synergies in trade and costs and other spaces. One of the big strategies of the company is to be the leading player in Sao Paulo. Anyone who wants to be relevant in retail can be out of the city of Sao Paulo. Everybody wants to start in Sao Paulo to be relevant, to be present here. We have several brands that uh, have been in their cities of origin for many years, such uh, as stores in Rio, that when they come to Sao Paulo in the first or the second, month they are already the leading store of their portfolio because of the purchasing power we have in the state so we want to strengthen our presence here in the interior of sao paulo which is already a consuming pole larger than sao paulo it's important to strengthen our presence there our footprint there and also we have to leverage the brand iguatemi we have interesting things we do with the brand we attract clients, uh, store owners who are interested to be together with our brand. They understand that we add value because we bring them this mix, but also it brings businesses. We make lots of partnerships where we have exchange with landowners. They look at the Iguatemi brand and that it adds value to the surroundings of the area to make residential developments, commercial in investments, such as in Ribeirão and Rio Preto. When we put the plate Iguatemi, everything around it increases to three or four fold time because it's incorporated to the new Iguatemi brand. There's, that means a new profile of consumers that has helped us to make new businesses. We have a guidance policy since 2008. We have followed that and we see the predictability of results, what we're able to deliver, and we have met the guidance. Since then, every year, we also had a guidance of long-term 
in 2009, when we made our follow one, we wanted to reach 2014 with an EBITDA of 450 or 500,000 uh, million reais. We went from 70 million to, in 2007, 500 at that time seemed to be aggressive target, but we are getting there. We have reinforced our guidance and we expect to achieve that goal at the end of the year. Our assets, once a year, we have the R&D of our shoppings. We look at uh, our market cap, at, uh, cap of uh, 3.9, EV today is 4.9. Our net asset value as a model, asset by asset, our properties are worth 6.8 billion reais. NOI of 15%. We just made the acquisition of JK. It's a multiple of 18. So uh, we have an average of 15. Doesn't seem so aggressive. Let me show you some pictures and the history of what we have inaugurated. This is our history. We went from 123 to 380,000 square meters, and we expect to achieve 500,000 square meters until 2017. This is our first outlet inaugurated in September of last year. It's 40 minutes from Porto Alegre, several brands. This is our first experience in that sector, which has been very interesting. We have a very interesting public for that. We're learning about that market in Brazil. It's not like the US, but this is an adjacent strategy. We have to look at that segment. That is an interesting path to grow for Iguatemi. We want, we see this desire to acquire good brands such as Nike, Track and Field, Arezzo, Schutz, North Face, all those stores that have relevant brands are attractive with 70% discounts, and we will attract a strong public. In Ribeirão Preto, we opened in the end of September of last year. Many new brands uh, went to the city. Interesting growth for us. Brands as Sinepla, Cultura, Cobasi, Calunga, other brands such as Hugo Boss, Top Shop, all that is a great novelty for the city and will consolidate as one of the main shoppings in the city. Esplanada, Iguatemi is a new one, but it's almost an expansion. We made 40,000 uh, square meters that was added and connected with this uh, corridor. If we go from one shopping to the other with this uh, space uh, catwalk, we have a suspended garden and glasses that will give us a beautiful view of the city. Lots of novelty brands. It's going to be total success. Our Christmas in Sorotaba, Sorocaba was better than expected. Sorocaba is an interesting example. Prob probably was the example of the ability of a shopping mall to open with more than 80% rented, we have 90% of occupation, we are being very successful, others have less occupation, suffer more. For Praje Bellas, the Bellas Beach, we saw an expansion, we converted the third floor into a shopping, it was a tech park to supply the necessary parking space, and then we converted the last floor into stores, taking more brands, and we strengthened our asset in the city. For the future, for this year, we will inaugurate Rio Preto on April 25th, 
and we have the expansion of São Carlos and the expansion of Iguatemi Campinas. We also have green fields in Jundiaí and two outlets in Tijucas in near Florianópolis and also in Belo Horizonte. And we have in Porto Alegre and another tower on top of the shopping that's connected directly. Here we have pictures of how it was and it, how it's coming how the construction is going on. This is the beginning of the year and it's going to be inaugurated. We're finalizing the stores. In Campinas, we have the construction started in 2013. Now we are in the structure phase and our inauguration date is going to be met. Porto Alegre, the same situation. I'm not going to go into case studies. I will give time for Q&A and I will pass the, give the floor to Carlos.